Good morning. Welcome to 2021. And I sure hope you've got great expectations for this year. I'm really hoping a great deal from it, especially after this last year. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris. And the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and other institutions around the world for the past 20 plus years and bring it to you via YouTube. The goal of this channel is to help you to read the Bible in a deeper and more meaningful way. So if you like the channel, please subscribe, hit the like button, and let other people know about it. Today, we're starting 2021 by looking at Epiphany. Epiphany is one of those dates in the liturgical calendar that is loaded with meaning. And being the complete geek that I am, I'm going to produce three videos on Epiphany. This first one you're watching right now, we're going to look into the meaning and the background, the history of the development of Epiphany as a feast within the liturgical calendar. The second one, we're going to look at the history and how the Magi have been interpreted, because that's the primary reading for Epiphany, and we'll look at why today. And then the third thing is, is that there's a story that developed within church tradition off the Magi visiting called the flight into Egypt. And we're going to look at that in the third video. So be sure to catch all three of these videos. And if you hit the little notifications bell, YouTube will send you a reminder when I post the next video. That way you don't have to check back on YouTube every 15 minutes to see if I've got it uploaded or not. Epiphany can refer to one day in the liturgical calendar or to a season. I'm only going to cover the one day or the Feast of Epiphany in this video. And I'm not going to discuss Advent or the dating of Christmas in this video. You're going to have to look at my other videos up here for those. So you can pause the video here, hit the playlist on Advent, and take a look at those videos if you like. And then come back to this one. So let's dive into today's topic considering the meaning and the history behind the Feast of Epiphany. And for that, we need to read Matthew chapter 2, the first 12 verses. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is this child who has been born King of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me words, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. So how did that get associated with this day in the liturgical calendar called Epiphany? The Atlantic just had an article entitled, I can't stand these words anymore. And in particular, one word they do not like is epiphany. And I'm going to read from the article here. It says, let's take epiphany as an example, not because I don't admire the lilting rhymes of those four syllables, but because I don't believe epiphanies exist. Sure, we may have a certain aha moment, but what do they add up to if they don't alter in some fundamental way the way we live? We're born, we die, and no one ever changes really. So what does the word epiphany mean? Well, it comes from the Greek epiphania, which means manifestation or revealing or shining light on something. Sometimes it was used to refer to the first light rays breaking forth at dawn over the horizon. 
They could refer to the manifestation of something or the revealing of something. Sometimes it referred to a king when he would go and visit and reveal himself to his subjects in a particular area. But in particular, it was often used in reference to the manifestation or the revelation of a god to one of its worshippers or somebody else. When we use the word epiphany theologically as a revelation or a divine manifestation of God to someone, it has a very subjective element to it. In other words, it is meant to produce a change in someone. When we use the word epiphany theologically to talk about Christ's manifestations within the New Testament, one of the things we need to realize is that the New Testament authors and the apostles were human beings just like us. And when Christ was out there walking among them, he was also a human being, and they could judge the book by its cover. But every now and then, that book would crack open its covers, and they would see the glory that he had shine from the inside out, and they would have this epiphany revelation or this epiphany moment where they realized something much deeper about who he was. And oftentimes you'll see fear, amazement, or shock when this occurs in the New Testament text. The Greek word is actually used five times in the New Testament, and I'll put a list up over here for you. But there's one particular case where it really relates to how it's used theologically through the church. And in 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, Paul writes, He is the one who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not based on our works, but on his purpose and grace. Grant to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but now made visible through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. And that phrase where he says, but now made visible through the appearing, and appearing there in Greek is epiphany that Christ breaking forth into the historical world and taking on human flesh was an epiphany, the manifestation of God to mankind. Now opposed to Advent and Christmas, which we can kind of go back and really kind of trace their history and development of them, epiphany has a rather foggy or muddled history behind it. Scholars who work in this area really think that the earliest Christians observed Epiphany based on John chapter 1, where it talks about that the Word was the light, and this light came into the world, and the light was the life of man. This whole idea of the light being the revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Then off that idea, it appears that two further developments came about. One was the idea that Epiphany was focused upon Jesus' baptism. Because remember at his baptism, a voice comes from heaven that says, this is my beloved son, and then the Spirit of God descends upon him. That's definitely epiphany. It reveals something about Christ's relationship to God and his divine nature. Other Christian communities really focused upon John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana. Because at that wedding, Jesus turns water into wine. And in John chapter 2, verse 11, John writes, in this way he revealed his glory and his disciples believed him. And that this was the first sign within John's gospel. Now what's interesting about that is we don't know how it revealed or what they believed about him. There was just something about that miracle that really keyed in with them and caused them to believe in Christ. There was a transformation that took place, unlike the criticism of Epiphany that the Atlantic Arthur's Journal makes. Within the early church, we seem to have like four trajectories that are taking place. The first one is, is that Epiphany was based upon John chapter 1. The Word was the light, and the light was the life of man, and it came into the world. The second one was Christ's birth or incarnation. The third one was Christ's baptism. And then the fourth one was the miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding of Cana. In fact, the confluence of multiple New Testament stories that then get associated with Epiphany is something that we see all the way down to around 1100. When Bernard of Clairvaux writes, he says that there are three Epiphanies, the Magi, Jesus' baptism, and the wedding at Cana. And so you can see that even within France at around 1100, they still saw multiple resonances within this feast day. And it wasn't until December 25th really gets set as the date for observing Christmas, which you can watch my video on that, I don't have time to go into that here, 
That all of a sudden the incarnation gets peeled off for the, uh, from the observance and remembrance of epiphany. Now the question becomes uh, one of what are we going to observe on this particular day? And around 450 AD, the idea of using the story of the Magi all of a sudden gains a great deal of traction within the churches. And there's a couple reasons for this. The first one is, if we have a Christmas on December 25th, to look at the story of the Magi, which comes just shortly after that in Matthew's Gospel, makes a great deal of sense. It not only follows it within Matthew's Gospel, just as the date of Epiphany on January 6th follows December 25th. The link between them within the text of Matthew and within the liturgical year made a great deal of sense. Now here's a little exercise you can do, is as you go through and you read the New Testament Gospels or you think back about them, think about particular texts where there's an epiphany. And we're not talking about any sort of text, we're talking about those where there's a special sort of breaking forth and revelation of his deity taking place there. A great example of this would also be the Transfiguration, when he's up on the mountain and he shines like the sun and the disciples are overcome with fear. So look back on the New Testament, the Gospel accounts, and see which stories you can come up with that you think would count as epiphanies. Not every text does, we're looking for very specific ones. And you can put your thoughts in the comments section underneath this video. The second reason why Matthew's account of the Magi's visit really gets associated with the observance of epiphany is because that story within Matthew's Gospel really has a high degree of emphasis upon the Gentiles, the non-believers, coming to worship Christ the King. This is something that carries through within Matthew's Gospel. We see it right here at the very beginning, and Matthew's Gospel closes in 28, 18 through 20, with the command, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. So this idea of the Gentiles, or all the nations, bookends Matthew's Gospel. And because most of us, ever since Matthew's Gospel was penned, have been grafted into God's plan of salvation, that we are Gentiles, just like the Magi coming to visit Jesus, theologically it makes a great deal of sense for us as Gentiles, we are coming to worship Christ, the newborn King, as well. Now why is the story of the Magi an epiphany? Well, it's an epiphany because the Magi are led to find Jesus by the appearance of this star in the heavens. And it might have been the alignment of two planets that we just saw with the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn, the closest they've been in 800 years. But I doubt that because this star leads them from the east to Jerusalem. Now you can kind of see where an astrological event would do that. But then once they're in, in Jerusalem, it leads them in completely the opposite direction. They go sort of southeast now, and the star resides over where the baby Jesus is. It's really sort of a supernatural revelation. It's not a star that's up in the skies, as a lot of people try and make out. It's also epiphany because Herod asked the wise men, when did this star appear? And the verb he uses there in the Greek is phanyo where we get the compound word epiphania or epiphany from. So the basic lexical root of the word is used here within this text. The third reason why it's an epiphany is because the text says that when Herod heard this and all of Jerusalem with him, they were afraid. There was something that in what the wise men said that indirectly caused a great deal of fear among them. The fourth reason why the church considers this an epiphany is because the wise men are warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, and so they return a different way. So there's four reasons why the church considered this an epiphany. One, the supernatural revelation of this star in the heavens leading the Gentiles, these magi, to Jesus. The second is Herod's use of the verb phanio. The third is the fear that this induced within Herod and the people of Jerusalem and the fourth is the divine warning within a dream to the Magi to return by a different route and not go back to Herod. The fourth century church theologian John Chrysostom writes, What then was it that moved them, the Magi, to bring gifts? It was that which had before moved them, so that leaving their own country, they had begun this so weary journey, namely the star, and together with the star, the light that God had placed in their hearts, 
which led them step by step to a more perfect knowledge. So you can see Chrysostom, as he reads the story of the Magi, really feels that this was a manifestation or an epiphany within the hearts of the wise men. John Chrysostom continues, and what he does is he says that the Magi coming to worship Christ is a fulfillment from the reading of Isaiah chapter 60 that is read this Sunday as well. Chrysostom writes, As the Holy Spirit in past times testified concerning them, the Magi, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gifts of gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. From Isaiah 60, verse 6. This prophecy is manifestly fulfilled by the Magi, who both announce the salvation of the Lord and by their gifts proclaim him Christ and God and King of men. For by gold they signify the power of a king, by frankincense the honor of God, by merit the burial of his body, so that they offer him gold as king, frankincense as God, and merit as man. Around 450, Ambrose writes about the power of this epiphany within the lives of the Magi in a very sort of allegorical way. So let me read his account here. He says, here is yet another proof. The Magi come by one way and return by another. For they who had seen Christ had come to know Christ, and they returned more truly, believing than they came. So he sees the journey of the Magi coming one direction and going back another way as a change in their life based upon the revelation of God in this infant baby Jesus. John Chrysostom also reflected upon this idea of these journeys of the wise men and how the epiphany of Christ to the Magi produced a changed life. It was also epiphany to Joseph. After the Magi visit and they return by a different route, in verse 13, Joseph is warned in a dream to flee to Egypt. And Chrysostom writes about this. He reflected on the relationship between the Magi's journey and then also the Holy Family's flight to Egypt. And he writes, Joseph is not offended by hearing this, the angelic command to flee to Egypt, nor did he reply, this is too hard to understand. Did you not recently say that he shall save his people, but now he cannot save himself? And now we must flee and travel far and dwell at length in a foreign land? But he said nothing of this sort, for he was a man of faith. So we see after the Magi leave, Joseph also responds to this revelation from the angel, and he takes Mary and his child Jesus down to Egypt. Now we're going to dive deeper into this flight to Egypt in a video that's coming up, so I'm not going to go into that a great deal here, just giving you a heads up. So by way of summary, what is Epiphany all about and what is its meaning? First off, it centers around the story of the Magi and how this divine revelation of this star led the Magi to worship the baby Jesus. Secondly, this idea of the star leading the wise men to Christ is important within the Gospel of Matthew. The star representing the light that's being shed to the Gentiles, the Epiphany, is then matched with Matthew 27, 41, where at Jesus' crucifixion, darkness covers the entire land. Light and darkness bookend theologically Matthew's Gospel. Third, the star in the heavens and the Magi traveling from the east represent two themes that we see throughout Matthew's Gospel. Here we see the star in the heavens and the Magi traveling across the land. In the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus prays, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so also on earth. And then finally, at the very end of Matthew's Gospel, once again in 28, 18 through 20, Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations or all the Gentiles. The star in the heavens and the Magi traveling across the land represent these themes of the heavens and the earth a theme that carries throughout Matthew's Gospel because Matthew is very intent on portraying Christ as the Lord of heaven and earth. Fourth, the gifts that the Magi bring 
cause us to reflect upon what do we bring? What do we sacrifice? What do we give to Christ? Fifth, this idea that the Magi were Gentiles cannot be overstated within Matthew's Gospel. Luke talks about Anna and Simeon in the temple and the shepherds. He doesn't talk about Gentiles so much, but for Matthew to bring in the story of the Magi right here at the very beginning is important because we have the Gentiles coming to worship Christ as a fulfillment of Isaiah 60. This theme is then carried all the way through Matthew's Gospel until we get to the very conclusion again. Once again, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And the word that's used there, ethne, is where we get the word ethnic from. So right here at the very beginning of Matthew's Gospel, the fact that the Magi are coming to worship the baby Jesus shows that the Gentiles are included within God's plan of salvation and that at the very end, it lays the responsibility upon us for seeing that that promise is fulfilled with all the nations or ethnic or Gentiles within the world, a job that we are still not finished fulfilling. The Feast of Epiphany really centers upon the revelation of God, the manifestation of His glory within the world, and then the change that it produces within those who witness it. Don't fall into the criticism that the author of the article in The Atlantic brought out. That epiphany is a word that they don't use because it doesn't produce change in the lives of people who witness it. The epiphany of Christ, the revelation of His glory, should be something that transforms and changes your life. And the story of the Magi calls us to remember this and to think about how we're going to instantiate that within our lives. I hope this little discussion of the Feast of Epiphany has been meaningful to you. Leave comments down below of your thoughts or ideas regarding this and perhaps other epiphanies that you see within the New Testament text as I was asking about earlier in the video. And I hope that this video really helps you to dive deeper into that particular story and make it more meaningful to your particular life. Have a great 2021. I'm really looking forward to this year. And until I put out more videos on Epiphany, why? Because I'm kind of OCD. I shall leave you with the word of peace.